So now like what we're gonna start with is how we got to, how science got to quantum numbers, because it was a whole sort of process. And what you really need to start with is electromagnetic radiation, which is light. <clears throat> so there are a lot of properties of light that were known. I think probably the speed of light was known. And we covered some of this already, the perpendicular electromagnetic and magnetic fields, or electric and magnetic fields, which why it's, is why it's electromagnetic radiation, because one induces the other, which induces the first. So super fast, we describe it using a few different parameters, wavelength probably being the primary one. Amplitude is the height of each of those waves, which is sort of a measure of intensity. So you can have light of the same color, but it could be brighter. For example, I guess these lights, we could dim these lights, and that would be sort of a lower amplitude of all the same wavelengths, because it's made up of a bunch of different wavelengths. Frequency is the other one. And so that's how many wave crests, or really how many of the same point in the wave pass per second. Generally, the metric used there. Hertz. Right, moving on. So, like the visible spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, is really just a small portion of the spectrum, but we can sort of put that part that we can see in terms of energy, starting with red being the lowest energy light, violet being the highest energy light. And I think this is about where we left off last time sorting those. So those are kind of the super basics of light. Now there are some other properties of light that we have to talk about that lead into quantum mechanics. One of those properties is interference. Okay, so I did talk about interference. Yeah. So interference is what happens when one wave interacts with another wave. And there are two ways that that can happen. And I think I drew and these are kind of the extremes here. One of them is constructive interference. So if they're perfectly lined up, that would be the most constructive interference you could have. So one sig the signals are essentially boosting each other. And they have to have, well, I don't have to have matching wavelengths necessarily, but here they've got matching wavelengths. And so you get a signal that's twice as high in all the peaks, twice the amplitude. Then for destructive interference, it's the exact opposite, where one crest lines up with another trough and so the resulting amplitude is zero. I remember now, because I talked about noise canceling headphones. Kind of the concept there. And then this doesn't have to be as extreme as all or nothing. You could have like partial interference. So they could be kind of lined up or they could be kind of canceling out anywhere sort of in between. Anywhere between completely in phase and completely out of phase. Diffraction maybe is where we didn't get to. Another property of waves, another property of light waves, if they encounter an obstacle or an opening, I like those, an obstacle or an opening in any kind of barrier that's about the same size as the wavelength, they will bend around it. They essentially will interact with that opening in a way that causes them to bend. This is called diffraction. So traveling particles, if you shoot a particle through a hole, it does not diffract. It will go through the hole. It doesn't matter if it comes close to the edge or if the hole is about the same size as the particle, it'll continue to travel in a straight line, which is more, more in line with ma the macro scale world, right? If you throw a ball, unless there's some other kind of field going on, that'll travel in a straight line, even if it passes you know, barely through a hole. This is one of the well, we'll get to this. So the diffraction of light through two slits that are separated by a distance comparable to the wavelength results in an interference pattern of the diffracted waves. And we'll see an example of that because that's kind of a lot to just like digest in terms of words. And that interference pattern is the way that those light, again, constructive and destructive interference, this one wave kind of gets split into two waves. And then as that light wave bends through each of those slits, you get a pattern, if you can view that light wave on a piece of paper or something, it'll create a pattern that shows you where they're being constructively interfered and where they're being destructively interfered. Particles won't do that. And I think this is the key here, is that an interference pattern is a characteristic of all light waves. So this is a thing that was known. If you have light waves, and if they create a, an interference pattern when shown through two slits of 
that are separated by approximately the wavelength, you'll get an interference pattern. It's kind of like a litmus test for is this a light wave? Is this radiation, this energy that we're producing an electromagnetic wave? Is it a wave of some kind? So as an example, if you have waves, they interact with this slit and a barrier, small opening, they will diffract. And so instead of being these parallel waves, they will bend and in the direct center, they'll still be traveling straight, but the closer they are to the barrier, the more they sort of get angled outwards away from the barrier, bend as they come into contact with that. And actually those, I guess I didn't pass them out. The, the what's it called? The spectroscopes that you guys used for that lab are diffraction gratings. They have diffraction gratings in them. So that plastic has a pattern in it that's roughly the wavelength of light. And depending on how close or far away from the wavelength of specific frequencies of light is, the more or less they bend. So that's why you can separate out those different colors on a diffraction grating like that. Instead of using a prism, prism would be another way to do it. So the difference here is that, right, particles, you fire particles at a hole, they will go through the hole, they'll travel straight through the hole. If they don't go through the hole, they bounce off the wall. It doesn't matter if they get close to the edges or not, they continue to travel in a straight line. So we take this idea, and now we do it instead of one opening, there are two openings. That's where you get this interference pattern. <clears throat> so there will be sections where, now we've created sort of two separate waves. There will be sections where those waves cancel each other out completely, and there will be sections where it's brighter because they're building on top of each other. The amplitude is higher. And there are links embedded in here if you want to go watch more videos about this. But this is the litmus test. This is, if you're, if you're a scientist working back in the late 1800s and you're producing some sort of energy, some sort of electromagnetic radiation perhaps, and you want to figure out, is this a wave? You could do this experiment. If you get an interference pattern, then it must be a wave. If it doesn't do this, if it, shoots straight through the hole, and you don't get this pattern, then it must be a particle. Or at least that's what they thought at the time, that it was either one or the other. <clears throat> so one of the experiments that you could do with light, or one of the weird effects that they didn't know why it worked, <laughs> is called the photoelectric effect. So photoelectric effect basically means certain types of metal, if you shine light on them, they will eject, that light will eject electrons from the metal. So for classic wave theory, it attributed this effect to the light energy being transferred to the electron. And at the time, they kind of sort of viewed this as, I mean, it was kind of like a late, like you think of a laser beam, right? Shoots in a straight path, it's a continuous stream of energy. And so what they thought would happen is if I shine any light onto these metals that produce the photoelectric effect, that, that energy on the surface would build up until an electron got ejected. So if I use lower energy light, a longer wavelength, lo lower frequency light, it would just take longer for that energy to build up to some critical point where the electron gets ejected. Or if you used, sorry, not necessarily the frequency, but the amplitude. So if it was a dim light, it should take longer for it to charge up essentially and eject that electron. If it's a bright light, it should take less time. So there was this idea that there would be a lag time if you use a dim light, right? It would just take longer to produce those electrons. This is the setup for sort of a photoelectric effect. This tube here is a vacuum tube, so there's no air inside of there. That's because if there was air, then electrons that are ejected would be intercepted by gas particles. But if there's no air, then you can have these two terminals, you can have a voltage source, and when you shine light on your metal, you'll read current. So there will be electrons being transferred from the metal plate to this, probably a cathode. Yeah, looks like it's attached to the cathode. So from an anode to a cathode, you get current. Electrons are moving. So they viewed this again. <laughs> My analogy that I came up with is like these super creepy looking clowns. There's a carnival game. So you've got a water gun and you shoot into the clown's mouth and the air balloon fills up with air. And when the balloon pops, then you win. In this case, they said, well, I guess to draw this analogy, these are the electrons 
And once they get enough energy from the streams of light, then it pops and the electron is released. And so using this as an analogy, right, if we used a fire hose instead of these puny little squirt guns, we should be able to eject those electrons really quickly by filling up those balloons. Now, in actuality, that's not what happened. So if we look at this chart, it's the frequency of light versus the rate of electron ejection, so how often an electron gets ejected. There's a frequency for the metal, well, a frequency of the light that you have to hit before anything happens. If you're below that frequency, you don't eject any electrons, doesn't matter how bright the light is. As soon as you get over that, then this analogy sort of applies, where if you increase the intensity of that light, as long as it's a high enough frequency, you'll eject more electrons. <clears throat> and so this suggested that maybe this analogy and this concept of a continuous beam of energy charging up electrons until they're finally ejected was not a complete view of what was happening. And it actually wasn't until Einstein that somebody came up with a sufficient way to explain this. Einstein's crazy idea was that light is not just a wave. So we shine light through the double slit experiment, you see interference patterns, it's a wave. But according to this and according to Einstein, there's actually a particle-like property to light also. And so he called these packets of light, he actually called them quantum or quanta. Photon wasn't, Einstein I don't think coined that term, it was coined later by somebody else. So he drew this parallel through the math that the energy of a photon of light is directly proportional to its frequency. So, and also that, thereby its wavelength. Right, inversely proportional to wavelength. So a shorter wavelength, higher frequency, means that those photons, these sort of light particles, have more energy. And he could show, again, a bunch of math happening behind the scenes to get to these simple equations, that it's proportional to Planck's constant. So you can multiply Planck's constant times the frequency of the light and calculate the energy of a photon. So this is kind of what you guys calculated. Well, it is what you guys calculated, right? You calculated the energy of individual photons from that experiment by measuring whatever their frequency was. So the reason that Einstein's <laughs> idea here worked is, so if we, if we think about these photons instead of being a stream, a beam of light, they're individual particles that are sort of being thrown at the electrons in the metal. And if we throw, in this case, in this milk bottle game, if we're throwing, make sure I get these in the right order, low frequency, long wavelength light, it's low energy. So it's like throwing a wad of paper at the milk bottles. It doesn't matter how hard you throw that piece of paper, it does not have enough energy to knock the milk bottles over. If we increase our frequency, move to a shorter wavelength, and each of those particles has more energy, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson here, it, yeah. I didn't Photoshop that on there, I did find it on the internet somewhere. <clears throat> but that rock's gonna have a lot more energy. And so now when we throw the rock, it has enough energy to knock an electron off. So in this new analogy, if we treat sort of the light as these individual particles, we have to have particles that are strong enough by themselves to knock electrons off. And then if you throw more electro or if you throw more rocks, you'll knock over more bottles and eject more electrons. So that's why you reach this threshold frequency that has just enough energy to dislodge a single electron from the metal. So each individual photon has to have enough energy to eject an electron, otherwise nothing gets ejected. And then that was related to this phi, or phi, I think it's phi, which is the binding energy of the electron to whatever nucleus it's on. So if you irradiate with a higher frequency photon, the electron absorbs more energy than is necessary to escape, and that lets it escape. So they get ejected. So the kinetic energy would be the energy of the photon minus the binding energy, and that can be represented by these two regions here. Where phi, is it phi or phi? Phi or phum? Sorry. Phi? Phi, okay. So phi here is the binding energy, and then if the energy of the particle is greater than that, then you have enough kinetic energy to leave. So we can relate this to 
frequencies of light. So suppose a metal will eject electrons from its surface when struck by yellow light. What will happen if the surface is struck by ultraviolet light? So right, yellow's in here. Ultraviolet, it's over here. So would no electrons be ejected? Would electrons would be ejected, they would have the same kinetic energy. Electrons would be ejected, they would have greater kinetic energy, or electrons would be ejected and they would have lower kinetic energy. Yep. And that means that the particles have each light or each light photon has higher energy. So exactly the same as the silly analogy here, right? If I throw the rock faster with higher energy, it'll knock the milk bottle away with higher energy. Almost exactly the same concept. Yeah, so they'll be ejected, they'll have higher kinetic energy than the yellow light. So this was a breakthrough because previously they thought a wave is a wave and a particle is a particle that can't have properties of both. But the photoelectric effect and the double split exper slit experiment showed that light has properties of both. And Einstein proved that. So we know that light appears like, behaves like a wave because of interference patterns, and other times it seems to act like a particle based on the photoelectric effect. And whichever behavior you observe depends on the particular type of experiment. Right, so each of those experiments produces a different property, more like a wave, more like a particle. So it was, let's see, are we, are we gonna get to that here? Nope, it'll be in a little bit. So this is where the atomic spectroscopy came, comes in, and this is what we did, and I think we actually looked at these slides already, maybe. <clears throat> so when atoms or molecules absorb energy, the energy is often released as light, because that energy has to go somewhere. So different elements will emit different colors, and you saw a bunch of those. So we've got probably mercury, yeah, mercury, helium, and hydrogen. Maybe that's, the, maybe that's backwards. I think this is hydrogen. It seems more red than the mercury was. But, right, so different elements emit different lights, or different colored lights, frequency lights. And then this is, again, what you guys did, except instead of using a prism, Instead of using a prism, you used a diffraction grating. So, yeah, now we know that, all right, so we've established that light can have the properties of both waves and particles. And now we're sort of being presented with this idea that the emission spectrum of light from a particular element isn't continuous. It doesn't produce every frequency of light. They produce specific frequencies of light, and that's what you saw with darkness in between. So we can use those to identify different elements, like a fingerprint or a barcode. And it defies classical physics. We'll see, we'll see more in a little bit here. All right, so some of the different spectrums, again, separated with a prism. Emission versus absorption. I think I did talk about this. So the emission spectrum of mercury versus the absorption, where the absorption has black bars where the brighter bars should be. Can also do this for flame tests. Different elements will burn different colors. <clears throat> and really in each of these sort of areas, it's a different way of adding energy. So here we're adding energy with heat. In the, the lamps that we used here, we're adding energy with electricity. But in both cases, we're exciting those electrons up into higher energy states. So the Rydberg equation, I can't remember if this came out. He came up with this right around. So Einstein's equation, his whole idea of quanta and photons was 1905. And so that's where he first released the papers basically proving that. Reitberg was another guy who was working on this problem. You guys used his equation to calculate R for all the different lights that you saw, or for the different energy states of hydrogen. And he just noticed there's this relationship between these different energy levels. <clears throat> So if there are these quantized energy levels, the difference between the energies, the inverse squared energies of those levels follows a constant. So going from any two levels, you could, you could basically determine what frequency of light would be produced, or you could calculate the energy because if you know the wavelength. 
You can calculate the energy. But he didn't really do anything. He basically just messed around with numbers until he found a pattern. But that pattern does suggest that there is some relationship here. And that pattern is the one in the Bohr model of the atom. Now, the Bohr model of the atom was great for hydrogen, but it was incomplete. So the Bohr model of the atom, if you remember from Chem 20, has the electrons orbiting on specific paths. So if you know this about solar system, and I could be partially incorrect here, but if, if the orbits of any planet in the solar system changed, it would change the orbits of all the other planets. And so there's sort of a stable sort of resonance between those orbits. And Bohr said that they could only be on these specific paths and that those correlated to specific energies. And then by using the Rydberg equation, we could say, oh, well, we can calculate sort of the energies between those, or at least the frequencies that are produced, jumping from one to the other. But like I said, this only worked for hydrogen. So if you try to extrapolate this out to anything more complicated with any more electrons, it falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. Its sort of core thing was that there was a relationship between energy levels and the energy produced. So, you know about quantized things. The energy is never observed anywhere in between those orbitals, or I guess in this case, orbits. There are quantum leaps between orbits. It's in one or it's in the other. It's never in between. So the energy of a photon is emitted when the energy difference between two, or based on the energy difference between the two stationary states. <clears throat> and again, using the Rydberg equation, we can calculate that from the wavelengths of the spectral lines but was ultimately replaced because it wasn't, didn't, didn't describe enough. It was incomplete. Okay. So now we know, I guess the summary of this is to say that there was some weird stuff about electrons that physicists and chemists didn't understand. Why can they only be in these certain orbits? Why can't they be anywhere in between? Because I think at this time, the electrons were viewed as particles. So it's a small particle that's orbiting. And so it must have particle-like behavior. <clears throat> de Broglie, Louis de Broglie, I believe read Einstein's papers, and from his papers developed his own thesis. So he was trying to explain why we see quantized energy levels of electrons. So 1924, he proposed that particles could have wave-like character in addition to their particle character. So he kind of took what we saw with light and photons, that light could have both wave-like and particle character, and he said, well, what if these particles could have wave-like character? And the wave nature of an electron is most clearly seen in electron diffraction. Remember, diffraction was where he had like the two, well, if you have a slit that's roughly the same wavelength, then you shine a light through it, it'll well, it'll spread out, it'll bend, and then if you have two slits, then they create an interference pattern. Basically, you can prove that you have something with wave-like particle, or wave-like properties. <clears throat> and that's exactly what they saw for electrons. So if you fire an electron beam through two slits, they create an interference pattern, just like waves would. But they're particles. But they're also waves. <laughs> so the interference pattern is not caused by pairs of electrons interfering with each other, but single electrons interfering with themselves. So the electrons essentially passing through both slits at the same time, and then creating its own interference pattern, because it's also a wave. Yeah. So this wave nature of the electron is an inherent property of individual electrons. Each individual electron has wave-like character. And de Broglie, his proof of this was this super simple equation where the wavelength of a particle was inversely proportional to its velocity. So this is Planck's constant again, divided by the mass of the particle times the wavelength or the velocity. I'm gonna do this, CK. Planck's mass. So Planck's divided by mass times velocity. And you can do this for anything. So you could calculate your own wavelength. 
Now, it ends up being nothing because Planck's constant is already times 10 to the negative 34. So for something to have a appreciable wavelength, it would also have to have an incredibly tiny mass when multiplied by its velocity in order for this to be any number that wasn't just disgustingly small. So here's the electron source. This is that diffraction pattern. So this was the proof that electrons have wave nature. So 1927, just shortly after Bogley proposed this, somebody read his paper and then went on to prove it. So when you shine electron source through two slits, you end up with an interference pattern, which again is sort of, a, it's proof that there's wave-like character. So an electron beam produces an interference pattern, same as waves do. Whereas if electrons behaved only like particles, there should be only two bright spots, because if they pass through the slit, then they pass through the slit. If they don't, then they don't, and they should only pass through one at a time. But of course, that's not what happened. Looking back on it, these slides should be reversed. Should be like, this is what we expected to see, this is what was actually seen. So proved to Broglie to be correct, and that they do have wave-like character. Okay, so Planck's constant, or right, this is gonna be Planck's constant over the mass times velocity and the wavelength. So if the electron has a wavelength of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, and Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. So the mass of an electron is 9.10938 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, and this is velocity. So let's do 6.626 e to the negative 34 divided by 9.10938 e to the negative 31 divided by 1.2 e to the negative 10. So, Velocity, 6.06 .06 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So pretty close to the speed of light. Not quite. Like if we redefine the joule, which is, the joule is kilogram meter squared per second squared. So this is kilograms, oops, kilograms meters squared per second squared times seconds divided by kilograms times meters per second. Oh, sorry, divided after rearranging. So basically swapped spots with meters and then the meters per second. So yeah, the kilograms will cancel, one of the meters will cancel, and then one of the seconds will cancel. Be left with meters per second. Yeah, so I, I ended up rearranging this so that it was velocity equals Planck's divided by mass times wavelength. So the wavelengths, yeah, 1.2 1, 1 times 10 to the negative 10. Any other questions? No? Okay. Right, so this kind of only works out because our mass of a kilogram is close to the same magnitude as Planck's constant, so we end up getting a number that and then, I mean, on top of being multiplied by this really short wavelength, will give us a speed that's really close to the speed of light. <clears throat> okay, so since quantum mechanical theory is universal, it'll apply to all objects, regardless of size. Therefore, according to the de Broglie relation, a thrown baseball should also exhibit wave-like properties. But why don't we observe such properties at the ballpark? Pretty much, because if we like, if you, I mean, a baseball is going to be less than one kilogram, but it's still going to be orders and orders of magnitude heavier than an electron. So if we take Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34, and we want to calculate the wavelength of a baseball, so I don't know what 90 miles an hour is in meters per second, but 
right? So like Major League Baseball pitch. Okay, well, we can do this. We have the internet. So that's about 40 meters per second. And then mass of a baseball in kilograms. Look at that, it's even a suggested search. 0 0.145 kilograms. So, to 6, e to the negative 34 divided by 0.145 divided by 40 means that it has a wavelength of 1.1 times 10 to the negative 34 meters. It's a really, really, really tiny wavelength, which means it has a lot of energy, which kind of makes sense because it's a whole baseball. <laughs> I mean, if you got hit by a 90 mile an hour baseball, that's a lot of energy. But basically, because it's so massive relative to this, right, we need to be dividing that by a tiny, tiny number in order to get anything appreciable out of it. Okay, so that's de Broglie wavelength. He essentially said, well, if light can have, if light can be a wave and have particle properties, then an electron can also have, which we think of as a particle, can also have wave-like properties. And said so that this isn't unique to light, but it's actually sort of a, well, part of this quantum mechanical world and the way that things behave. So you can think of the reason that they form these shapes that we see in sort of these fields, well, these, the probability densities, right? Like an S1 or 1S orbital is a sphere. That's like the sort of like, the, you can think of it like a standing wave of that electron. So that it exists within that region because that's where it's most likely to exist because that's like a harmonic, kind of like a harmonic frequency on a string except it's constrained based on different parameters. Right, so wave-like property, particle-like property, also some other weird things that come out of this and related to the uncertainty principle. So if you try to observe the wave nature of the electron, you can't observe its particle nature. So depending on the experiment you set up, you observe one or the other, you can't do both. So the wave nature is the interference pattern that you'll see. But if you set up another experiment to observe the particle nature, that's all you'll see and you won't see the interference pattern. So the wave and particle nature of an electron are complementary properties. So they work together. They're both properties of the electron, but the more you know about one, the less you know about the other, which is just, I don't like it. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good. I think you're gonna see how it feels less good in a second. So this is that same sort of experiment where we were observing the interference pattern. We got the two slits, shining an electron beam. The difference here is that when an electron passes through a slit, it immediately comes into contact with this beam. And when it comes into contact this with, with this beam, it creates a flash. And then we can see spots on the other side here. So when you set this experiment up, an electron only appears to pass through one slit at a time, and we no longer see an interference pattern on the other side. It's just behaving like a particle. Yeah. Well, if, we had, if, these, were, if these were circles instead of slits, then we would see circles over here instead of slits. Yeah, yeah, so over here, let's go back to the other one. This is the interference pattern. You see a bunch of lights sort of spread out, or a bunch of bright spots across the whole detector surface. So whatever this detector would be. But if we sort of intercept each electron as it passes through the slit, it lights up on one or the other. And then there's no interference pattern beyond that. So because here, so I guess in this experiment, we're not determining anything about the position of the electron. We don't know about its position, we just know it's passing through the slit. And so because we're not measuring anything, and it feels weird to say because we're not measuring it, but when we measure it this way, you see the wave-like properties, where you know nothing about the position, just that it's acting like a wave. When you do this experiment, you're determining its position by causing it to interact with the beam on the other side of the slit. And so because we know exactly which slit it's going through, we know a lot about its position, 
and that destroys the information, I guess, about its velocity. I'm not sure if I can explain it better because I don't think I understand it much better. <laughs> it's, yeah. So Heisenberg, same, same Heisenberg name origin as Breaking Bad. <laughs> This is a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I'm sure in the, in the TV show when they were doing that, they were thinking of this reference to this. Right? What's Heisenberg going to do? But this equation explains how, or is, is an example of how if you know more about one property, you'll know less about the other property. So x is the x position. Here the delta doesn't mean a change in, but it means the uncertainty in the position or the uncertainty in velocity. And we can't simultaneously measure the position and the velocity of an electron. You can only get one or the other. And that's the core thing to understand here. So which base statement best summarizes the uncertainty principle? Well, I'm not a fan of this wording. The, well, either the position or the velocity of an electron can be accurately known at the same instant. Like, you can't know I think it's B, but the way that this is worded is weird. I feel like if we get rid of this, this makes a lot more sense. Because the idea of at the same instant means that you could somehow, like this is like either of them could be known at the same instant, but it's not, you, you can only pick one. Yeah, you can't go back and look at that instant again. Right, you can't reverse time, look at that instant again to know the other one. You can't come back to that same instance. Right. For any given moment, for any given particle, you can measure one or the other. So I know why you all went for C because, anyways. Yeah, so the, the idea of those, you get one or the other. Can't have your cake and eat it too. Okay, right. can we talk about this? We haven't talked about this yet. Oh, I did talk about this a little bit. So this idea between determinancy and indeterminancy, I mentioned it earlier on because the macro scale world is determinant. If I throw something, we can know the position and velocity of it, and we can use those to, well, we can use physics to figure out where it's gonna land. <clears throat> so that's determinancy. The present determines the future. So if I know something about the present, I can make a determination about the future. Indeterminacy means that the future can only be described statistically. So if I know something about the present, I can know statistically something about the future. So I think the example used before was if you throw a baseball. So if I throw a baseball, I'll know exactly where it's gonna land. If I know all of the factors about it, I can determine where it's gonna land. If you throw an electron, you can know, well, either the position or velocity of that electron, but it only tells you an area where that electron could land. And this is this idea of probability distribution map. So last week when we did the, the orbitals and stuff, you guys had to look at those distribution maps. Those were the probabilities that that particle would be at that distance from the, at that radius from the nucleus at any given point in time. So again, classical concept of trajectories, deterministic. It's probably even better like this. If you, a baseball is hit towards you, you can track that baseball through the air, know where you need to run and where to catch it. And our brains do that automatically. Or as I like to say, automagically. <clears throat> For a baseball, it's like if you threw it, and then it could be in any of these points along that path. So, not deterministic. Yeah. <laughs> It stops and then it comes back and then it goes forward again. Who knows? So I guess in terms of real baseball, like that pitch is for any pitcher throwing any kind of certain kind of pitch, it's gonna land statistically in a certain area. You maybe before the pitch can't say exactly where it's gonna land, but probably land in some of these areas. Okay, now we're getting back to where we kind of started last week. So the electron energy and position are complementary. Mass times velocity equals the kinetic energy of an electron. So you can determine the energy, and you can determine the, or you can de determine the velocity, right? and that'll tell you the energy of that electron, but it doesn't tell you where it is. 
So the best we can do is describe the electron's position in terms of an orbital. And so those were what you were looking at last week. Those were prob probability density maps in three dimensions of where the electron could be, or is most likely to be. Yeah, many of the properties of atoms are related to the energies of the electrons. So Schrodinger's equation is the one that defines all of those orbitals, those wave functions that you were looking at. And each of those wave functions, phi, that describes the wave-like nature of the electron, so a plot of phi squared represents one of those orbitals. And so depending on the different parameters that go into Schrodinger's equation, you get out the different orbitals. And those were the, the quantum numbers that we talked about. So the principal quantum number gives you the general region. The angular momentum quantum number gives you the specific orbital and orbital shapes. Then the magnetic quantum number tells you which of those specific orbitals that you're describing with the Schrodinger equation. And then you can have either you know, negative half spin or positive one half spin. So, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, so then we were, when we were talking about these and when you're looking at them, like, so if, I mean, n is one, right? That's the first principal shell. The only possible quantum number there is, yeah, L equals zero or S. And S only has one type of orbital. Yeah. So we talked about a bunch of these. For hydrogen, the energy of an electron in a given orbital can be described by this negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n squared, which might look a little bit familiar to the Rydberg equation, right? but for a single orbital. So the relationship between any two orbitals is that Rydberg constant for hydrogen. Uh, okay, so we're going to kind of gloss over some of these things. So we can calculate the energy for any specific orbital, or really principal quantum shell. We've got our angular momentum quantum numbers again. Those start at zero. Zero corresponds to S, which is the letter designation. So one, two, three, zero, one, two, and three, S, P, D, and F. And then also on that simulation, you can see that it goes beyond that. So for each combination of quantum numbers, there are sort of different possibilities. And there are more possibilities as you get farther away. Magnetic quantum numbers, or L, which is the number of the angular momentum. No, it's the magnetic quantum number. L is the, magnet, or the angular momentum. So this just tells you the orientation of the orbital. So for some of them, like you saw with the p orbitals, right, they're all the same but each one is in a different axis around the nucleus. There's one that's exactly on the x-axis, one that's on the y-axis, one that's on the z-axis. And as we increase into these higher order orbitals, they get more and more complex because they're trying to fill up all of the possible spaces around the nucleus. And as you pack more and more electrons in, there are smaller and smaller sort of sectors that they can fill into. So there's only a certain number of possible m sub l's. We've only got two spins. Yeah, so each of these combinations will describe a single orbital. We looked at these already. Lots of numbers. Mm. And this is the atomic spectroscopy stuff that we did, where these orbitals have different energy levels, which is, again, why we do the whole electron configurations and the way that they fill in in that order. It's because they have different energy levels. And so if you're being excited to a higher energy level and then relaxing from that higher energy level, that corresponds to the wavelength viewed in that atomic spectrum. So we're bouncing between those orbitals. So excitation and then relaxing back down to a lower energy level means that energy has to be released, and it's released as a photon, emitted as a photon. So to transition to a higher energy state, the electron must gain the correct amount of energy, corresponding to the difference in energy between the final and initial states. And then once it gets up into a high energy state, it's unstable. And so it'll lose energy and go back to a lower state. Each line in the spectrum corresponds to one of those sort of perfect energy level transitions, which is why you can use them in for hydrogen specifically, to calculate the Rydberg constant. Yeah, so it can transition to any state below the energy state that it's in.
and you'll have that many lines. Yeah, so both Bohr and the quantum mechanical models will predict those for the one electron system, but not anything really past that. Here is where we basically get the Rydberg equation. Different constant being used here, right? But the difference in energy levels, the difference in n squared of each, oh, it froze. This is becoming a more and more consistent thing. Oh, good. Thought it crashed. Please don't crash. Please don't crash. Ha, no crash. Okay. So this is essentially the Rydberg equation. It's the energy final minus the energy initial. If we break that out and we plug in this, equa or this number that we had earlier, times one over n squared, we can factor out the two times 10 to the negative 18, 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18. And this looks a lot like the Rydberg equation. Yeah. I don't know why these, I mean, I guess it's more calculations that you can do from there. So from here, like the change in energy of a single photon would be per one atom. So for a mole of atoms, you would multiply that by 6.022 times 10 to the 23. And we could also calculate the frequency based on that energy. And then these, this is actually, Sort of what you observed without the energy level or the ener level energies at these different levels, right? The chart that you had in the lab manual had the transition energies in there or the energy to get to each level. And then here you've got different frequencies of light that are produced from those different levels. And I believe these are the ones that you had five, four, and three, all going back down to two. So which transition emits light with the shortest wavelength? What happens is you get to higher energy levels. What happens to the spacing between them? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it would be C. Because, and we can see it here, <laughs> as you go up to higher energy levels, the distance between those energy levels gets smaller. And we're going to talk about, at some point, I think it's, actually, no, I don't think it's in this chapter, but there's this idea of effective nuclear charge. So how much the any given electron feels the pull of the nucleus or is really stabilized by the positive charge of the nucleus. So as you get like, to, I mean, going from one to two is a huge jump because n equals one is the closest it could be to the nucleus and it's the most stable. Making that first jump from one to two Two is a lot less stable than one, so there's a big difference in energy there. Going from two to three, well, you're already so far away from the nucleus. Moving a little bit doesn't change it that much. And then for every level above that, they get smaller and smaller and smaller because you're feeling less and less of the pull of the nucleus. It is similar to magnets, right? If the magnets are touching each other, that force is really strong. But as you pull farther and farther away, it drops off pretty quickly, especially for magnets. So same sort of idea happening here. So any transition close to the nucleus is gonna have a higher energy level. So if we wanted to determine the wavelength of the light absorbed when an electron in a hydrogen atom makes a transition from an orbital in which n equals two to an orbital in which n equals seven. We need the Rydberg equation. Although, actually let's do it this way. So the Rydberg equation will take us there directly but we can use this. And it's negative 2.18, and that's times one over n final squared minus one over n initial squared. And that's gonna give us delta E. And then if we know the, if we know the energy, then we can calculate the wavelength. So 2.18, 10 to the negative 18, times one over, Seven squared minus one over two squared. This is 5.001, sorry, 5.0051 times 10 to the negative 19. That should be joules. And then E, if we want the wavelength, the E equals is equal to H nu HC over the wavelength. Oh, wait, it was right up here, huh? Yeah. But we want to know the wavelength, so we can rearrange this, solve for wavelength. 
and again, H is planks, C is the speed of light, and E is the energy. This is 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Planck's constant is 6.616 times 10 to the negative 34. So wavelength is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, okay. 397 nanometers. The actual number that you'll get out of this would be in meters, but I just did the conversion. Because 1 times 10 to the negative 9 meters is a nanometer. Questions? Wait for the calculators to stop. So it's okay, keep going. I want you to actually calculate things. Cool. Everybody get the same number? All right. All right, so probability density is really just like density, like we think of regular density, right, which is grams per milliliter. Probability density is the probability per unit volume. So if you took an area, a unit, or a volume, and you said, what's the probability that it's within this volume? That's probability density. And so these are all things that just come out of the Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's equation. So the S orbital is spherical, which I think kind of makes sense from an intuitive standpoint because it's the simplest of all of the shapes of all the other orbitals. And it's the first one. So like the first lowest energy level is a sphere. It's the simplest shape. So your probability density will decrease as distance from the nucleus increases. So basically, if you get farther away from the nucleus, you're less likely to find the electron there. If you're to pinpoint its location exactly. Right, the plot resembles a multiple exposure photograph. The electron is not moving around the nucleus like a moth around a flame. So it's not like traveling in paths around the nucleus. It's kind of appearing, disappearing, and reappearing at different spots within that area without crossing the distance in between. It'll just go from A to B. It doesn't have to go anywhere in between. So yeah, over time, if you tracked every single spot where the electron was, you'd get these probability density graphs like this one. And so we can, we can describe this as the probability density versus R. So R here is the radius, radius or distance from the center of the nucleus. So the, one of the other ways that you look at these is that if we were to add up, or if we were to integrate this from zero to infinity, that would add up to 100% probability. Right, so it could be anywhere from the nucleus to infinity, and yes, it's going to be in there 100%. Now, there's going to be some point where you hit some diminishing returns on this, and you're going to get to 99.999%, and it's not going to be anywhere near infinity, but you would have to go infinity to get the whole 100%. So we could slice out a section of this, for example, and say, like, in this section, there would be some probability that it's in this section, and let's just call this... I don't know, we give them arbitrary numbers, one to two. So if we integrated from one to two, that would tell us the probability that the electron is in that distance from the nucleus. So it's the area under these curves that tell you the probability. Or you could, I guess, do the probability for a single point, perhaps. <clears throat> I guess we shade this in. And then the reason that this is a, well, I guess, yeah, this is the reason that this is a sphere and not just a cloud all the way out to infinity, because by the time you get out to like some point here even, that's already almost all of the probability. Beyond that, the chances of it being in that area are just absolutely minuscule, right? Just teeny tiny. So, so this radial distribution function, which represents the total probability of finding an electron within a thin spherical shell at a distance from the radius, or a, a distance r from the nucleus. So it gives us a better picture of where the electron is likely to be found. Total radial probability be the probability divided by the unit volume times the volume of the shell at R. Yeah. I mean, it is essentially what I explained. Essentially integrating from the center to an outer radius in order to get where inside of that distance it is. So.
it can't be in the nucleus, so it has to start at some point outside of the nucleus, and there is some optimal range. So the maximum of that radial distribution function is going to be 5.29 picometers. So really just outside of that. And then maxes out there and then decreases as you move farther away. So that is the distance that Bohr predicted, which is great for him. However, he said that the electron would have a orbit at that distance. So that it would be traveling and it would always be at that distance, traveling in a circle. Whereas the quantum mechanics says the electron is found at various radii and 52.9 picometers is just the most probable. So you're most likely to find it there. Kind of like if I go home and I'm most likely to find, well, we'll say I'm most likely to find my cat standing in front of the refrigerator waiting for catnip. <laughs> right, very probable spot to find him when I get home. Yeah, 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 exactly. So then the 2s and 3s or orbitals are also spherical. And I think I alluded to this earlier. So you've got nodes on a string. So if you have a string in some distance, it's going to have these nodes. And so those nodes are places where the string is not vibrating at, vibrating at all. The places in between are where the string is vibrating. And that's kind of what's happening with this electron. And part of this idea that it has this wave-like characteristic. So it's acting like a wave and has these nodes where it's practically 0% likely to be found, and then these areas in between where it will be very likely to be found. <clears throat> and so as you're moving away from, or you're moving to higher energies, distances from the nucleus, you're going to find these nodes and then these areas of increased probability sort of analogous to calling this 1s, 2s, 3s, if this is the nucleus. So those 2s and 3s orbitals will each have nodes. And so again, you saw these patterns. So you got the 2s, really high probability below this, and then zero probability, that's the node, and then high probability again. Then the total radial probability really not likely to be found inside of that node, more likely to be found outside the node. And then our 3s has two nodes now where it has low probability, and then outside of that, there's this higher distribution, higher probability distribution curve. I guess we should just finish this. Right, so our s orbitals, L equals zero. The principal energy level has one s orbital. And the number of nodes is going to be n minus 1. So these are kind of things that you determined last Wednesday, right? Saw these trends. For the p orbitals now, there are three separate p orbitals, negative 1, 0, positive 1. And they've got different names, each one along a different axis, perpendicular to each other. So one node at the nucleus, total of n nodes. So we can look at those. Each of them has this going to have the same radial distribution function, but along a different axis, right? So if you're going along this node, that's what it is. If you went along a perpendicular node, you would get a distribution function for a different orbital. But three identical orbitals, each with two lobes, each along a different axis. And then as we keep going on, they get more complicated. So d orbitals, there's five d orbitals. And now we've got negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two. And these ones are each aligned to a different plane. And then the fifth orbital is aligned with the z-axis. So, and they're mainly four-lobed. The one in the, the fifth one is the two-lobed with a toroid. Yeah, and then you'll get special nodes at higher or, or higher principal shells. All right, so the d, y, z orbital is in the y and z plane. So it's the plane made by the y-axis and the z-axis. The dxy is in the xy plane. xz is in the xz plane. And then x squared y squared is in the xy plane. Right, so each of these is finding a plane. And then because they do that, they don't overlap with the p orbitals. Because the p orbitals, well, aside from this one, 
But the other P orbitals... Oh wait, no, these ones do... This one's X, Y. This is exactly on the X and Y. So some of these do line up. And then the DZ is this weird one. And again, the electron is in that orbital and it can travel from the dumbbell shape to the toroid shape without passing the area in between. Because they're freaky like that. Then F equals, or F orbitals where L equals three. There's seven, okay, cool. Seven different orbitals, mainly eight lobed orbitals. Some are two lobed with a toroid. And again, we're trying to fill any remaining space around the electron as tightly as, or around the nu nucleus as tightly as possible. So this, these are gonna get more and more complicated. And this is where we start adding spherical nodes also. So these ones are pointing for the most part out in between these axes. <clears throat> Although there will be some that are on the axes. So like these, these three kind of line up with the P orbitals, and these are kind of combinations in between. Orbitals are determined for mathematical wave functions. So the Schrodinger equation defines these wave functions, and they can have phases. So the sign of the wave function is called its phase. So if orbitals are interacting, their wave functions may be in phase and have the same sign, or out of phase, opposite sign. And we'll talk about bonding later and how that applies. So 1s orbital kind of has this single phase, so it'd be positive or negative. 2p orbital has two phases in it. And then why are atoms spherical? Well, because when we add up all of these orbitals, we've taken up all of the space inside of a sphere. It's like packing a bunch of balloon animals into another balloon. All right. <clears throat> 